Uh, more seriously, thank you all for coming. It's, it's really an honor for me to be here. And, you know, you look at the lineup that Father Billy is uh, talking about, His Ex Excellency Archbishop Chaput last week. And in three weeks, the, the truly legendary Professor Robert George will speak. And if you haven't heard him speak, um, you'll understand why I'm really glad he came after me. <laughs> and Excellency Archbishop Lori after that. So given the, the, the stature and leadership roles of these men, I, I had to wonder why I'm in the lineup and, and uh, I started worrying I'm the comic relief. So <laughs> if I really mess up, that's, that'll be the case. Father Billy pointed out that it's been four years since I uh, was drafted into the Beckett Fund by the board. It's a funny story actually, I had no clue that I'd be asked to come and run a public interest law firm I'm not a lawyer and actually know or knew, uh, maybe I still don't know much about constitutional law, so I wasn't very informed. Uh, what I had been uh, was a donor, which if you need any further proof is uh, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> um, but I, I firmly believe for, from my own life that um, when something really surprising is, is presented to you, that's providence. And so I, I said yes, and I haven't regretted it, even if at times I've been humiliated by my ignorance. So. The Beckett Fund is an unusual organization. You can think of it as the tip of the spear in the religious liberty fight, uh, but it plays a very specialized role. It's essentially an appellate law firm that seeks to uh, change the law to allow, especially US law, to take the shape that we believe it's intended to take so that it can fully, fully protect religious liberty. So at the core, in the engine room of what the Beckett Fund does is it takes cases on appeal and tries to move them up to the highest level of court. Um, I am not a lawyer, and uh, even, for those of you who are lawyers, you wouldn't want me to talk about the law, you'd wince, and for those of you who aren't lawyers, you wouldn't want me to talk about the law, you'd be bored. So we're not gonna talk about cases by and large. My job in the four speakers is to talk about the American experience, the continuing American experience with religious liberty, and that's what I'm going to do. I travel a lot uh, with the Beckett Fund, and everywhere I go, uh, there's no question that anxiety about religious freedom, religious liberty, is very high in America, and not just among Catholics. I meet with people of all faiths. Uh, this anxiety is fueled by stories, true stories, of children who are sent home because they brought their Bibles to school or CEOs or fire chiefs who are fired because they do a simple thing like affirm traditional marriage in public, uh, Catholic nuns who are forced by the federal government to provide abortion coverage for employees, and of course, we're all assaulted every year by those annoying stories about Christmas trees in the public square. So I can attest these stories aren't blown out of proportion. They're not the odd story taken by the news and run. These are pervasive, these are constant, uh, and there is no doubt, ill treatment of religion and religious expression at all levels of government across our country is far too common. And yet, in these travels and in my discussions, I find often, far too often, people seem to make the journey from absolute complacency about religious liberty to total despair in a single bound, like reverse Superman. And, and I attribute that tendency to melancholy to golden age stories, and we all know them. It, it goes something like this. Americans came to this country seeking religious freedom to worship as they please and in return allow others to do the same. Our founding fathers understood this and made religious freedom the first freedom. For 200 years that freedom was honored until secularists broke the compact and discarded the long-standing legal and societal protection of religious liberty for all. Now, there are aspects of that story that are very true, but you know, beautified versions of our past history can make the challenges we face today seem shocking and unbearable. Why is this happening to us? And I think Catholics in particular should know there's more to the story. Religious freedom was not a shower gift that the baby got when the country was born, all wrapped up and ready to be used. It's a project that's required constant building and periodic restoration in this country. 
So I am an optimist, even as I go around and hear all these stories and my emails flooded every day with one you know, really frightening or annoying religious liberty story, but I'm actually comforted because I've, I've looked, I've been forced to look at the American experience and know that this project is an ongoing project. So let me offer three quick observations and then lay out the history as I see it uh, and then take a look at where I think we're going. So the three observations. First, Americans have really embraced the term separation of church and state for 200 years. But the meaning has always been contested. Now, last week, Archbishop Sheff, you talked about the breakdown of language and the dishonest use of language. But even before this degradation of our language, there was considerable disagreement about what separation of church and state meant. So Americans love religious liberty. We just don't agree on what it is. That's the first thing to keep in mind. The second is that the struggle for religious liberty right now is not unique. So it has some aspects that are remarkably similar to quarrels of 150 years ago or 100 years ago. And then in other ways, it has shed some of the defining elements of the struggle, most notably the animosity between Protestants and Catholics that's really central to the religious liberty fight in the United States is, is more or less missing from this round. And the third is I think it's a mistake to lay the blame for this fight at the Supreme Court. So there's no doubt the court plays an important role but they really reflect the opinion of the country, especially the opinion of the cultural elites. So those opinions are really at the back of what's going on with the Supreme Court. So I should pause now. I get a lot of pushback sometimes when I use the phrase elites. And you were told to shut off your iPhone, so I'm glad because otherwise you'd jump to Urban Dictionary and try to figure out what the slang definition is. I did it, and I'm glad you can't because two of the definitions are unbelievably vulgar, so don't do it. The, the third one says the definition of elites is way cooler than you. So, but for the purpose of this talk, cultural elites are people who have power and status and are actively engaged in shaping the views and the opinions of society. So it's less about money and more about influence. So with these observations in mind, and pardon me, let me start by noting that at the Constitutional Convention, 1789, 87, whatever it was. Religious liberty was not a hot topic. It didn't generate fierce debates, didn't, didn't get its own compromise to get talked about for 200 years. It just wasn't a big issue. So when, when the First Amendment did address religious liberty, it did so as a jurisdictional issue. It basically said, this is what Congress can't do, didn't bind the states. So obviously, there was lots of religious strife in America before the Constitutional Convention, but at the time that the Founding Fathers gathered, it was really not the issue that was getting everybody hot under the collar. But it wasn't very long after that. It was in the 1800 election that I think the first salvo of the religious liberty fight for the New Republic was fired, and that's because Thomas Jefferson was accused of deism or atheism by Congregationalist ministers that were supporting the Federalist Party. So they were really hammering Jefferson as, a, as an atheist. So this is when Thomas Jefferson wrote the letter that is very famous. It's the uh, letter to the Danbury Baptists. So as soon as you get into the religious liberty grid, you know, like I am, you hear this letter all the time, and it reads like this, the key part. Quote, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should now he quotes the First Amendment, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then Jefferson continues in his own words, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Now if this was an audience in a college or something, we'd always begin by saying, who thinks separation of church and state is constitution? Everybody's hands shit. It's not in the constitution. It's in Jefferson's letter, not in the constitution. But 50 years later, this letter was being employed in Supreme Court cases as evidence of the shared consensus of drafters of the Constitution. As I'll get into later, the metaphor figured prominently in key 20th century Supreme Court decisions. But at the time, I have to repeat this, it was put into a letter as part of a political battle. It was not a statement of shared belief. And Jefferson was hoping to use it to blunt his opponents. Essentially, he wanted to keep the clergy out of politics. So shades of the Johnson Amendment. So, but the metaphor didn't take flight. And, you know, 
what my reading of it, and I'm neither a theologian or a lawyer, but it really goes back to sort of city of man, city of God debates that had been taking place for a long time. And, and the idea of what was the right separation of man from government, it was, it was, it was an issue that there wasn't a lot of consensus on among religious leaders. And they sure didn't want to drag it into a political context and just plant it there as a done thing. So it never really got any traction in those years. But, so that was the first round of the fight. What really shifted the religious liberty fight into high gear, though, was the arrival of the Catholics. So when Jefferson wrote the letter in 1802, Catholics were about 1% of the population. By 1850, 7%. On the way to 1900, by, to 16%. So at the time of the Constitutional Convention, Catholics were not figuring in the equation. Decade by decade, they started to figure. Ground zero of the co collision between Catholics and Protestants was the schools. Parents naturally want their children to be educated in their faith, and Protestants were the overwhelming majority. And even though they were divided among denominations, as a rule, they compromised at the schoolhouse door. And what they did is they employed reading from the King James Bible without commentary, that helped get over some of the doctrinal disputes they had amongst each other, and a teaching of a generic, non-denominational Protestant Christianity. So as you can imagine, Catholics did not like this solution, and the bishops responded by opening Catholic schools, and that was it. The rest of the century was marked by constant quarrels about public funding for Catholic schools and compulsory attendance at public schools. So this was it, decade after decade. So you have to go easy on the Protestants. They didn't have a crystal ball. They couldn't look far to the future because all of us know if they looked far enough ahead, they wouldn't have worried because they would see that the Catholic schools were going to stop teaching the Catholic faith without the government pressuring them. <laughs> but they didn't know that, so they were pretty hot under the collar. We know how important schools are, and the bishops knew how important back then. So. The fierce debates about the schools spilled right into politics. Municipal, obviously, mayors were getting hit, state, and eventually got to national politics levels. So as a result of that political friction, Protestants uh, in the majority advanced this idea that democracy in the new democratic republic requires citizens capable of making free decisions. That's free of ecclesi ecclesiastical oversight or interference. And so by this standards, Catholics were considered unfree. They had to obey Rome, or they had to obey their priests. And therefore, the rising Catholic population was not just a religious threat, it was a political threat, a threat to the democracy. So from this consensus, this political dispute emerged a consensus that the, the elites of the country, who were overwhelmingly Protestant, and the majority, majority Protestant, held. And this idea was that separation of church and state meant the separation of ecclesiastical authority from government. That was the definition. And a commingling of government and religion, like in the public schools, did not violate the separation of church and state as long as the religion was not sectarian. That was the phrase. And by sectarian, they meant citizens did not rely on the authority of their clergy, but instead relied on the authority of their individual conscience formed through reading the Bible. Nice formula. Because, of course, that formula excluded Catholics, but it left the door open to most other Christians. And sometimes the argument was made the door was even open for Jews. But it was the consensus. So the constitutionality of this understanding of separation first of church and state wasn't challenged in court. It couldn't be. Because if you recall, the First Amendment applied only to Congress, not the states. And the federal government wasn't running schools. Schools were run at the state or local level. So that consensus, you could think of it not as a separation of church and state, uh, a separation of church and state, but not a separation of church and religion. That was held by the majority, Protestant majority, but it was bound to be challenged as more Catholics entered the country and immigration wasn't letting up. But there was another dynamic at work. At the end of the 19th century, the nation's elites, who had been overwhelmingly Protestant, grew increasingly enamored with various freethinker movements, you know, scientific theism and some of the consequences of, of Darwin and some pre-Darwin thinkers. And these secular liberals, that was their own phrase, by the way, they called themselves secular liberals, were not satisfied with the formulation of church and state that merely had the 
practical effect of excluding Catholics. I mean, they certainly didn't like Catholicism. But what they were seeking, the secular liberals, by their own statements, was a complete separation of Christianity from the state. And they were aware of the fact that the First Amendment did not apply to the states and that it didn't include the phrase separation of church and state. So they sought a constitutional amendment that would explicitly require separation at all the levels of government. So the public, and in this case Catholics and Protestants both, were not interested in adopting a new de definition for separation authored by professed atheists and that argued for stripping religion out of the public square. So the constitutional amendment failed. So the secularists then turned to a new direction, which was changing the culture and challenging in the courts. But I have to pause. The first thing they did was have a bitter, bitter quarrel amongst themselves about pornography. And the two sides of the argument were that it should be completely free with absolutely no restrictions or mostly completely free without <laughs> restrictions. And that slight division about pornography was enough to shatter the movement and they went and disappeared from sight for a while. But they left it in less savory hands. I have to tell you, I was thinking of titling this The Ku Klux Klan, Pornography and Nuns. But for a lot of reasons, which you can all figure, I didn't do that. <laughs> But you'll see why as the story progresses. <coughs> so the secularists faded from view, but even less savory companions of the separation of church and state joined the fray. That was the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. So they made separation of church and state central to their various platforms. And by 1925, when 40,000 hooded Klansmen walked down Pennsylvania Avenue, separation of church and state was starting to uh, loose the bounds of religious gravity and become a testimony to American patriotism. So for all these forces, you know, by the time you got to the early 1900s, the concept, the idea, the phrase of separation in church and state was unchallengeable. But the definition was still wide open for debate. And religious pluralism continued to look like the likeliest force for changing that definition. So by the end of World War II, Catholics hit their 25% level where we've been since. But significantly, the Nazi regime discredited anti-Semitism and cast into question the idea of a consensus about separation of church and state that excluded Jews. So between Catholics and Jews, the pressure was on, but it was the secularists who actually broke the mold. Now, they had failed in 1880 to get the constitutional amendment, but they found much greater success in amending the culture. So by you know, at the end of World War II, a substantial percentage of the elites, the cultural elites, were secularists. And they wanted to make their presence felt. And they, once again, the flashpoint was the public schools. So after 100 years of debates over public funding for religious schools, finally the Supreme Court stepped in in 1947 in Everson versus the Board of Education. And this was a case about bus money for kids going to Catholic schools. So in some ways, it was sort of like a, a repeat, only with you know, gasoline engines, of the debates they had in the 1840s. But the court broke the mold. It did something very different this time, and three things of importance. First is it applied the religious freedom clauses of the First Amendment to the states and their subdivisions. So whereas before it bound Congress, now it bound all the levels of government. And then it offered a form of neutrality towards religion as the basis for applying the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment. And it raised separation of church and state into a constitutional principle. So it really hammered in that. The opinion was written by Justice Hugo Black, who was a Ku Klux Klan member, and then when he left the Klan became still a vocal supporter of the Klan. So, Maybe the court, maybe Justice Black had expected that by this opinion, they would get to preserve that old consensus for a little bit longer. But they were putting new wine into old wineskins. Essential to that 19th century consensus was the idea that separation of church and state did not exclude the teaching of non-denominational Protestant Christianity in the schools. But the Supreme Court decision was to establish a doctrine of neutrality towards all religion and elevated that wall of separation metaphor into a doctrine. So they put it on a collision course with the old consensus. And by 
constitutionalizing to the state and the municipal level separation of church and state in the First Amendment, they guaranteed that collision was going to be nationwide. No way to make it local. So it didn't take but 15 years, 1962, famous Supreme Court decision on school prayer. So here's the key. That decision, banning school prayer, prayer in schools, was a shock to the public. They hated it. But it wasn't a shock to the cultural elites. No big deal, nothing to look at here. Why is that? So there's a great book by Professor Stephen Smith, and he says this. From the perspective of those for whom the secularist view has already become virtually axiomatic, in elevating the new view to constitutional status, the court was doing nothing more than clearly articulating what must always have been true. And this is the key. The secularists, the court, viewed them they weren't issuing a new interpretation. They weren't establishing a new consensus. They were simply affirming what was always true. So you have to think about it. The 1880 campaign, not, not the one for pornography, the one about amending the Constitution, that's the key. 80 years, secularists have been moving through the elites. And by the time 1962 came along, they were really used to the idea of separating religion from public life. And this is why I say the Supreme Court is not the dominant player that it looks like, because the court was simply absorbing the opinions of the secular elites. But that brings the question. If by 1962 we're into the contemporary age of religious liberty, isn't it the same as all the other fights? I mean, if we had these fights for a long time, we just have a new consensus. Some people are on the in, some are on the outs. Same old, same old. I think there are two key differences. First. The old consensus was unpalatable to a few religious minorities, specifically Catholics, Jews. A state or a government that tramples the religious convictions of a minority is certainly unfair, but it can be very stable. The new consensus is unfair to the religious majority. And a state that steps on the religious beliefs of a majority is not stable. And you see it. Because since that 1962 decision, you've had an amazing tumult in American politics. The moral majority comes into place. The culture of war is prominent in all of our political disputes. So that's it. The public is pushing back. They don't like the new definition. They're pushing back. So that's one difference. The second significant difference is that this, in this contemporary religious liberty fight, the elites want something radically different. So the old consensus was essentially conservative. The Protestant majority facing immigration was trying to preserve what had existed before. They're trying to hold the line. That was their goal. The new orthodoxy of church-state separation is fundamentally immodest in its scope. So it's committed to completely segregating religion from government. So in a world where health, education, and welfare is the purview of the federal government, a strict separation or segregation of religion, right down to ensuring no legislation based on religiously informed moral convictions, like Robbie George will tell you, it's tantamount to a government banishment of religion. And here's the interesting thing, as I said earlier. As dramatic as this new formula is, the elites who hold the view don't see themselves as imposing a new ideology. So Professor Smith again. Even as they aggressively assert themselves, modern liberal secular orthodoxies typically hold themselves out not as orthodoxies, but rather as being opposed to orthodoxy, as being neutral. So I'm going to pause here and recap. And if you just came in or if you fell asleep, everything I said for 20 minutes, you're going to get five fingers of the hand. Very easy. Americans love the separation of church and state. They just don't agree on what it means. For 150 years, Protestants and Catholics fought over it, mostly about public schools. For the last 50 years, secularists have insisted the fight is over and that government now ensures neutrality at all levels. But neutrality turns out to be a decidedly non-neutral formula for strict separation that essentially expels religion from any part of society touched by government. And since the government is growing, the space for religion is shrinking. And the public has resisted this approach, but the cultural elites refuse to see this as the establishment of a new orthodoxy, and they are unfazed by the resistance. So let me finish. Where do we go from here? 
So if you predict history by drawing straight lines, this looks pretty bad. So instead of moving towards an understanding of separation of church and state that we might broaden to affirmatively embrace all religious belief, we're on a path that equates separation of church and state as requiring the segregation and ultimately the suppression of all public religious activity. So this may be neutral, but it isn't benign, and the public is sensing that there's something not very neutral about neutrality. So three forces are routinely cited as pushing this line. Now I mentioned, these are not three forces I believe, these are the forces I read about all the time that are pushing this forward. And first is the apparent decline in religious belief, or at the very least, the growth of the nuns. So I told you that's why it was part of my title. That's Americans who self-describe their religious belief as none in the surveys. So earlier I said that the secular orthodoxy is stable because, or is unstable rather, because it's pushing a view the elites have that the majority who are religious don't hold. But if these surveys tell you that more and more people are going to be nuns, they're going to be secularists, then maybe we're on the path towards making that consensus stable. And if it's stable, because the elites hold it and the majority hold it, then that frees the government to begin a more radical segregation of faith from the public square. And this point is not lost on the cultural elites. And they've been very active in using their commanding heights, the schools, the universities, the media, and the entertainment, to promote this point of view. So beyond the, the growth of the nuns, a second factor that's cited that pushes this sort of neutralist, secular theocracy forward is the expansion of government. So we've seen a dramatic illustration of this with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, if the federal government dictates for all Americans the parameters of health care, then any religious convictions that touch health care are automatically a church-state issue. An absolute separation of church and state leaves no room for compromises. Religious scruples have to be banned from health care. So we've seen that already. Abortion, contraception, we're seeing it in euthanasia, we see it in embryonic stem cell therapies, we'll see it in cloning for organ transplants, transhumanism, it doesn't matter, there's no boundaries. If health care is the domain of the state, religious morality cannot be present even as an underlying rationale for, for rules or regulations. And it's not just healthcare. Everywhere the government extends its reach, this dynamic will be repeated. So we, the Beckett Fund, we have a new case. We're defending a Native American preacher who ceremonial bald eagle feathers, which he uses for his religious worship, he's Christian by the way, were seized by the Fish and Wildlife Service in an undercover sting operation at a powwow. And I wish I was joking or setting up for a joke, but that's the truth. So now let me tell you, if the preacher had killed the eagle on his government subsidized wind farm, no problem. He'd be free from persecution. But he's using those feathers in a religious service. He doesn't have the right to do that. It's a felony. Nine years. So here we are in the Alice in Wonderland kingdom of neutrality. And when government enters the space, religion has to exit. So the third force that is cited to push towards this dark future is a little hard to explain, but it's the movement to place the redefinition of sexual morality as a civil right rooted in the Constitution. Now at first glance, this may not sound sinister, even if it doesn't seem desirable. After all, it sounds like we're just getting another right added on top of our existing rights. But unfortunately, this is not emerging as an additional right but it's being brought in as an either-or proposition, and the government has its thumb on the scale. So, as I said, the secular orthodoxy rejects legislation based on religiously informed moral convictions of voters. That's key. If the voters are bringing their religious convictions to the polls when a law is passed, it violates separation of church and state. So traditional morality is undoubtedly rooted in religious belief and religious traditions going back centuries. So by this logic, any appearance of traditional sexual morality in any law or government regulation is essentially unconstitutional. And if you're hearing marriage in the background, you're right. But recall 
The new sexual morality, which is not rooted in religious beliefs, are now becoming constitutional rights. And neutrality doesn't apply in an either or proposition. When these two clash, one constitutional right not rooted in religion and one constitutional right rooted in religion, this wall of separation of church and state dictates that the religious morality has to lose. So that's the third force. And it's there, you can see it and read about it. It's pretty grim. So the youth are abandoning God, the welfare state is banning the church from cradle to grave, and the sexual revolution is replacing the First Amendment. And I'm telling you, I'm an optimist. <laughs> and they offered me wine at dinner here at the seminary and have a drop, so that's not the reason why. So here's why. First, and, and the most powerful reason why I'm an optimist is I'm a former nun. Now, in the age of transgenderism, I need to make sure we're paying attention here. Uh, I won't keep you in suspense. Uh, my parents had no religious belief whatsoever, and neither did my grandparents. So my last name is Muma. Muma's are Mennonites. You'll see them all over central Pennsylvania, but not for two generations, and some will say three or four if they weren't Christians. So I was raised without any religious instruction whatsoever, no hostility, but no instruction. And I will tell you, I would therefore have been one of those nuns. But I'd also tell you, if the survey was put in front of me, I would know what I would be looking for, and it's the box that, would, that I'd want to check that said, Seeker of God, because I was at a very young age. And I'm telling you, I think the nuns are too, and the man who's done the most to popularize the phrase, Robert Putnam, he will tell you this is a very fluid population. So the nuns are not anti-religion necessarily. They're people like I was. So that picture of religious fluidity, which I'd like you to hold to, that's a key source of optimism for me. I have a firm belief that those nuns, the 20% of the country who are nuns, are just as possibly the raw material for a new Great Awakening as they are for a new surge of secularism. So. The second picture, the second part that really makes me optimistic is that the people do not like the new definition of religious liberty, the new definition of separation of church and state. And I know this because at the Beckett Fund, we have closely examined confidential survey data. Now, these aren't the push polls that you read all the time. Those are polls that are really designed to get a sound bite, and both sides do it. You know, you ask people, you know, if your mother was dying, wouldn't you want her to have a priest? And then 95% of people say yes, and then they say, there you go, 95% of the population is Catholic. You know, that's not a poll. You're seeking an answer, you get the answer you want. Um, we've looked at some very expensive, very confidential survey data that really tries to get at what people think about religion and religious liberty. And here's what it says. It turns out about 12% of the country thinks religion is a problem and therefore they think religious liberty, the purpose of religious liberty, is to protect people from religion. That's, so the Establishment Clause is a license for the government to drive religion out of the public space and to save people from religious bigotry. And of course, our elites are heavily represented in that 12%. So, 12%. On the other side is 41% of the country who are religious believers who support religious liberty. They're committed to their faith, they believe religion is good for society, and they believe freedom of religion is essential to our democratic republic. 12%, 41%. Another 18% are religious believers who are indifferent to religious liberty concerns. So they're busy, they're turned off by politics, they're not inclined to disputes. And we, you know, if you go to mass, two of your, two people to the right will be hepped up on religious liberty and one will be not cared at all. So the, the statistics bear out our personal experience. That's 18% of the country. And that leaves 29% of the country. And this group is interesting. So they're mixed religiously. Uh, nuns, faithful, agnostic, atheistic, the whole mix. They're inclined to believe that religion is a private matter and they are suspicious of religion in the public square, but they're not hostile to religion. What they love is liberty, any kind of liberty. From gun rights to religious liberty, they're pro-liberty. That's 29% of the country. So, if you do the math, you can add the religious believers together, that's 41% and 18%, and you get 
or you can add the liberty lovers, the religious liberty lovers and the generic religious liberty lo generic liberty lovers. That's 41 plus 29, you get to 70 percent. Or you can go for the whole enchilada, put them all together, and you get 88 percent. Any way you look at it, it's not a good set of numbers for secularists. So that's a powerful second source of optimism for me, is the numbers tell you, from a political standpoint, people don't like what they're seeing on the separation of church and state. And the third source of optimism, and my arm is going to hurt patting my back here, is what the Supreme Court has been doing in religious liberty. So, you know, it's, it's very common to read a lot of resentment of the court. I understand that. But we have to remember that it was 70 years ago that Justice Hugo Black authored this decision on neutrality. That was back in the golden age, right? And we all know 40 years ago, Roe v. Wade. So again, that's way in the back. So a lot of resentment about the court is, seems to be predicated on, a, on like an absence of historical memory as if this is all happening right now. This is, the court was a problem a long time ago. But in the last three years, the Beckett Fund has gone to the Supreme Court three times. And we won all three times for significant religious liberty cases. And I think that tells you the Supreme Court is open to the right arguments based on the right principles. So in 2012, we won 9-0, 9-0, unanimous, in Hosanna Tabor, and that was a case which affirmed the right of religious ministries to pick their own ministers, a super important case for Catholics and for any hierarchical church. That was widely hailed by friends and foes alike as the most significant religious liberty decision in 50 years. So then last year, in another landmark decision, the court ruled for Hobby Lobby. And this was in the HHS so-called contraceptive mandate cases. And the court confirmed the right of private business owners to insist that government regulations accommodate their sincere religious beliefs. And then just this year, the Beckett Fund won its case Holt v. Hobbs, and the Supreme Court granted us this unanimous victory again, affirming that prisoners' religious liberty cannot be limited unnecessarily. Three decisions. In addition, by the way, we got preliminary injunctions or temporary relief for Little Sisters of the Poor and for Wheaton College until that aspect of the HHS uh, contraceptive mandate can be finished. So three victories in the Supreme Court, two, two preliminary injunctions from the Supreme Court, and then a fourth 9-0 victory from the Supreme Court by a Beckett Fund attorney who defended the free speech rights in front of the Massachusetts abortion clinics, a case he had taken nine years ago when he was still at a commercial law firm, carried for nine years, went before the court last year and got a 9-0 victory. Wow. And by the way, we have you know, success in the state Supreme Courts and some of the circuit courts as well. So, so here's what, it, what I would say. Is, is my own life experience, and I, and I would suggest yours, tell us that people, even the nuns, are ready to be evangelized. And sophisticated survey data tells you that people are not convinced of the new neutralist, secular orthodoxy about religious liberty and separation of church and state. And victories in the Supreme Court by the Beckett Fund, and there's others, you know, tell you that the courts are still open-minded. So those are the raw ingredients for, for optimism. But ingredients require something else. They require a recipe. And throughout my talk, I have returned the idea that our countrymen, Americans, embrace the idea of separation of church and state, but they can't define what it means. So to transform the public support and the open-mindedness of the courts, we have to give a definition of religious liberty. And that's where dignitatis humanae comes in. So the explanation provides the recipe. So this is a pretty well-educated audience. You guys have all probably read it. I read it and I was shocked. This was four years ago because it's, you know, it's a classic kind of Catholic document. It's a little obscure. But after a lot of thinking, I realized, like all the Catholic documents I've read in the course of my life, and I'm a convert, is, you know, it pops out finally after you look at it enough, it has the truth. Here is what Dignitatis Humanae asks from governments. Four things. Provide an effective constitutional guarantee of religious freedom. So check that one. Our First Amendment does it, and 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act, 
RIFRA reinforces that. So our Constitution and our laws got it. Second, it says show, the government should show favor to the religious life of the citizenry. But that was the Hobby Lobby decision. The Supreme Court says the Green family, privately owned company, the government has to show favor to their religious activity. The Declaration says honor the religious freedom of both individuals and communities. That's very important. Catholics worship in community. We form religious institutions. That's what the Hosanna Tabor 9-0 work was about. It was telling the government it had to honor the appointment of ministries. It recognized religious rights in communities, not just in individuals. And four, it says restrictions on religious freedom should be controlled by judicial norms and be in conformity with the objective moral order. And that was a reduction of the two paragraphs, by the way, so I think you should be appreciative. <laughs> So what does it really mean? It says there are going to be times when the government's going to place restrictions or rules around religious, free, re, religious activity. Prisons are the classic case where the government has, we expect and give the government the right to restrict religious activity. And that was our Holt case this year, 9-0. The government says, the, the court said to the government, you can do it for safety and security of the prison, but there's limits. And religious liberty has the rest of the space. So what the declaration asks of governments, our government has. We know it's bending and twisting, and it was 100 years ago, by the way, but it's still there, and it's been affirmed recently by court cases that the Beckett Fund has brought. So we have the public that wants religious liberty. Our higher courts are open to the argument. Dignitatis Humanae gives us that well-reasoned, spiritually grounded recipe. So now that we're using that recipe metaphor, I'm going to go the distance. All metaphors have to be extended until the audience hates them. So we have the ingredients, we have the recipe, what do we need? We need cooks. And the document asks for the cooks to come forward. Here's what it says. One, this is directed at individuals now, not governments. One, do not use religious liberty as a pretext for refusing to submit to authority. Spread the gospel, but have prudence and patience for those in error and the ignorant. In other words, don't fear or despise the nuns. Three, Exclude every manner of coercion when it comes to faith. And so I think for this audience, the first three points require no elaboration. But here's the fourth. Make the freedom needed for the church to care for the salvation of men a preeminent concern. And so I can't think of a better point to close my talk. So the church is asking us in this document to make religious liberty a preeminent concern. And we need to engage we need to persuade and educate our fellow citizens. We have to advocate for political protections of religion and religious freedom. And we need to take our disputes to the court and win. So my experience at the Beckett Fund in this regard is clearly one of the reasons why I'm optimistic. I have the privilege of working with very talented people who are very committed to this mission. And I've traveled the country and I've met Americans, Catholics and non-Catholics, who are willing to make religious freedom a preeminent concern. And I welcome all of you, probably already engaged in that, but if you're not, or if you'd like to do more, I welcome you into that religious liberty fight. So thank you, God bless America, the land of religious freedom for all. So I'll take questions if you want.